So I'd like to just say a word now to wrap up this, this, this section here, topic, topic 12, about uh, the, the, the church in Jerusalem. Uh, remember that in Medina, the Muslim movement now has political power, and with that mechanism, they're able to put the move to, to, to uh, the movement um, is put in place and, um, and develops. Christians um, look to that Jerusalem experience, and it's quite different, isn't it? Jesus marches into Jerusalem with an army of singing children. <laughs> Goes into the temple and cleanses it with a little scourge of, uh, of ropes, you know, of, of, of uh, chasing the cows out of the temple and so forth. And I can imagine the children gleefully joining him and helping him overturn the tables of money and so forth. And the authority is saying, look, Jesus, what's going on? These children are singing Hosanna in the highest and they're helping you throw these tables around and whatnot. Please make them behave themselves. And Jesus says, if the children stop singing, even the rocks and the stones in the temple are going to, are going to start singing with joy. And then he makes it quite clear in the dialogue that goes on there that, um, that uh, this temple will be no more. Going to, going to be thrown down. Uh, in other words, this temple isn't needed. There's a new temple. He says, destroy this temple. In three days, it'll be raised up, referring to he himself. But as we look on at the New Testament, he's also referring to the church, the church which is the body of Christ. And the church is the new temple. And so there is no geographical center needed, you see. Oh, my. I wish somehow that our Jewish and Muslim friends in that struggle in Jerusalem could see how significant this is. But Jesus is initiating a new movement, you see, in which it is the people of God who are the place where God dwells. You don't need a temple made of stones. You don't need a temple mount, you see. Um, you, you don't need a Kaaba. Uh, there's, there's this new community in which God dwells, which has no need for a geographical place, you see, uh, which Christ is creating. And of course, the Jewish authorities found this very disturbing, this kind of talk, and it is one of the reasons that contributed to his crucifixion. Uh, they felt he is not respecting this temple built of stones adequately. But Jesus is making it very clear. There's a new temple coming, and that new temple is formed at Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit is poured out and people from nations everywhere, nations here and there, are present on that day, hear the gospel in their own language through the miracle working of the Holy Spirit, and their lives are transformed, and 3,000 are baptized, and the church begins. The church begins as a movement bereft of political and economic power. It is a very vulnerable movement but it is a movement of great power, for it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And for the next 300 years, the church moved from society to society as a vulnerable people, often suffering persecution. It had no political power. And then, as we said the other day, comes that huge watershed, the Constantinian watershed, where Constantine, we talked about this the other day, put upon the, sh the shields of his soldiers this sign of the cross, the high row sign. And under that sign, he was able to defeat Maxentius, his rival. And, uh, and, uh, and so from that time on, church and empire in the Western world become married with a very, very close relationship. Now on the edges of the empire, this merger of church with empire became disastrous. First, let's just look at North Africa. In North Africa, in North Africa, a hundred years after Constantine, the Donatist movement is underway. Which was an indigenous church growth movement in North Africa. The church in North Africa, apart from the Donatists, was mostly Latin. I mean, Augustine, who was one of the bishops of North Africa, one of the mo certainly the most widely read bishop of, of, of the ancient church, Augustine lived there in North Africa, and uh, he was Latin. So the churches were Latin, 
the language of the church was Latin. The scriptures were Latin. Um, it was a Latin immigrant church. But the Donatists, they were Berbers. They were indigenous to North Africa. And the Donatists began to get interested in the gospel. And the gospel began to move among the Donatists with great power, you see. It was like a wildfire. And you know, hundreds of thousands of Donatists were becoming Christians. But it's outside the Catholic Church. It's not the Latin Church. It's a Donatist movement, Berber movement. And um, Augustine didn't know what to do about that. Because he believed that anyone that is outside of the church, the Catholic Church, is going to hell. And so Augustine co-opted the power of the state to work with him as bishop in destroying the Donatist movement. When I get to heaven, I want to ask Augustine about that. Because when Islam came through that region 200 years later, the indigenous church growth movement, which was Berber, had already been destroyed, you see, by this fusion of church and empire, working together to destroy what Augustine considered to be a heresy. Now, maybe on the edges, some of their theology may have been a bit questionable. But having said that, it was an authentic African church growth movement, Berber. But that church had already been destroyed by the Catholic Imperial Alliance in North Africa before the Muslims ever came. Now, we thank God that today there is the beginning of a turning to Christ across North Africa, different places, including a lot of Berbers coming to faith in Christ. We're saying, let's go back to the faith which predated Islam, which was our faith, which was Christian, beginning to rediscover that faith. But, um, but the church was greatly weakened by this alliance of church and state. Perhaps more pertinent to uh, the regions where we serve and work, uh, who are part of this gathering of this seminar, um, would be what happened in Persia, which is present-day Iran. The Persian church was, um, was um, always suffered persecution under the, under the Zoroastrians, um, but not intense persecution, occasional persecution. And then, when Constantine uh, became emperor, um, the, the, the Western Empire, the Constantinian-led empire, and the Persians were heading toward another one of their wars, which they have had occasionally. The West and Persia somehow occasionally seems to have gotten into wars over the centuries. And another one of these wars was looming. And um, so Constantine is arming his troops and getting ready for the war. And of course, all the troops have uh, the sign of the cross on their shields. And bishops are marching with him. There's a church historian called Eusebius who lived at that time. And he writes about how that, how that uh, Constantine uh, has the, um, has the um, uh, on his crown, the cross is on his crown. Eusebius says, and he talks about these bishops in their white flowing clerical garb, marching with Constantine, praying that he will be victorious. And then Constantine sent a letter to the Shah of Persia, that's the, even today, it, in the pre-Islamic revolution, uh, you had the Shah, who was the leader, the governor of Persia, wrote a letter to the Shah and he said, I'm commanding you, treat the Christians in your fair land justly. What, what, what did the Shah think that meant? Constantine is coming to make war against Persia. And he writes a letter to the Shah of Persia saying, treat the Christians gently. I'm commanding you, treat the Christians gently and justly. What do you think the Shah thought when he gets that letter? He thought that it must be that the Christians in Persia are in alliance with Constantine, his enemy. See, his enemy is coming with a cross on his crown, bishops marching with him, 
he now writes saying, treat the Christians kindly. For the Shah, it meant only one thing. The Christians must be in alliance with my enemy, Constantine. So he killed the Christians? He killed the Christians. He ordered that all Christians in Persia be killed. Brothers and sisters, this persecution was the worst persecution the church had ever experienced. I mean, we often read about the suffering of the church and the persecutions that came under one emperor after another in the Western church. And those persecutions were bad, but this one was simply horrendous. The Persians intended to kill all Christians. For, it went on for 20 years. You know, so the church went thoroughly underground. So this marriage <laughs> of the Western church with imperial power on the edges of the empire brought disaster for the church, such as Persia. So I'm spending a bit of time about that because it is very important for the church to be clear what the church is. We're representatives of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and not of political powers and empires. We seek to be faithful citizens. I don't mean don't be faithful citizens, and it's difficult always sorting that out, what it means to be faithful to Jesus and, and, a, and a loyal citizen. But, um, but empire and the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, political empire and the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ are different movements. And when the two merge, it distorts the nature of the gospel, as happened here. And consequently, on the edges, oftentimes, people can suffer immensely. And um, I'm sharing that rather carefully because there's some analogies with what I'm talking about and the present situation. The Iraq situation, the Christians in Iraq have suffered immensely, just immensely, under what has happened. And multitudes have left the country because of the perception that somehow this is another crusade. And it goes back to the crusades over you know, a thousand years ago when these Western armies would march into the Middle East under the sign of the cross to, to kill Muslims. I was recently in a dialogue with an Iranian theologian in Germany. And in one of my presentations, I shared exactly what I shared with you this morning the journey of Jesus from Galilee to the cross, and the nature of the kingdom that is formed through what happened at the cross. And when I sat down, she stood up, and with anger she said, I never before knew that the cross has anything to do with loving the enemy. I always thought the cross meant slay the Muslims and slay your enemy. I didn't know this. And she was angry. You know, I wept, I cried. I said, may God forgive us. Oh, may God forgive us. For the many times the worldwide church has distorted the cross. And I hope you can forgive us for the sins of the church against the Muslims in the name of the cross. So often. Three hours later, it was her turn to speak after lunch. And she said, the last three hours have been the most transformative hours of my life. I don't know where it will take me, but your tears and the confessions of the sins of the church against us Muslims have opened my eyes to a Jesus I didn't know was there. And I don't know where it will take me because never before have I experienced a Christian asking forgiveness of us Muslims for the sins of the church against us. I just thank you. I thank you. And I think when we face of these kinds of things that the church has often done towards Muslims, we need to walk with utmost humility. Friends of ours live in Beirut, Lebanon, and they say that in the cathedral there, one of the cathedrals there in Lebanon, there are crosses all around the wall of the crosses, and beneath the cross is a sword. <laughs> it's a crusader church. Beneath the cross is a sword. And in Kosovo, I've been to Kosovo several times, during that war, Muslim-Christian war, why when a Muslim village was burnt to the ground, uh, they would plant crosses in the ashes of that village, you see. And so I say, for many Muslims, the cross, the offense of the cross is not because Jesus suffered on the cross. The offense of the cross for many Muslims is a misunderstanding 
perception that the cross means violence against the Muslim. Oh, may God help us. <laughs> I'm not chuckling because it's funny. It's my African chuckle, which chuckles because it's so sad. TVS is a perfect way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support our educational and outreach ministry today. We exist solely upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvseminary.com. Yes. Are there any like, uh, attempts of the Pope to uh, ask forgiveness for the Crusades? Uh, did it happen before? Uh, will it ever happen? Or will it help if the Pope will ask forgiveness from the Muslim uh, yes. world? Yes. Yes. No, I think those steps are helpful. I think they're very helpful. And, and uh, yes, and thank God for that. And you might be aware that for several years there was a Christians in pilgrimage. They started in England, actually. And what they did, they followed the route of the Crusades from England through Western Europe and on into the Middle East, through Constantinople, you know, through, through Istanbul, through Turkey, and on, on all the way to Jerusalem. And all the way, they would go both. See, the Crusades not only fought the Muslims, they fought the Orthodox as well. They would go to the Orthodox churches and ask forgiveness. This was Westerners, Western Christians marching with crosses <laughs> and saying, we've distorted the cross. May God forgive us. And we hope you can forgive us. And praying prayers of repentance and asking forgiveness. It was very well received, very well received. And then, as you know, the Pope himself, Pope, Pope John Paul, also took that journey into, into Syria and so forth and went to the local mosques and whatnot asking forgiveness for what the church, expressing contrition for what the church had done in the name of the cross. So I think those sorts of gestures can be very important and very helpful. Let's look at uh, page uh, 21, number four, the New Testament church and the Ummah. Again, looking at, um, at contrast. Um, and uh, we'll start with our women at the back again. We'll start with Olga, 4.1. Please read. All right, the church should influence a political or economic system with concern for uh, justice and righteousness, but not control or depend on such institu institutions. Church and state are separate. Their umar should be supported by the state. State and umar should be united. Uh, and of course, let me just say, this comment is the way we Baptists and Pentecostals and Mennonites and so forth feel about church-state relationships. Um, we live in a region of the world here where um, the dominant uh, Christian community probably would have some questions about that, separation of church and state. Uh, but it's the free church movement that bears witness to this conviction that church and state should be separate. But I think we acknowledge not all Christian communities would quite would, would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, the church should respect the freedom of the person and bears witness to the authorities that God Himself gives people freedom to choose or reject faith. Uh, the rights of the woman supersede the rights rights uh, of the person. Okay, I'd like to just make a, comment, make a comment about that as well. You might be aware that the United Nations has a statement of, on human rights, uh, which most nations in the world have accepted, have embraced. Um, and also in that is a statement of religious freedom. People have religious freedom, freedom to choose their faith. Um, the global Muslim community have been uneasy about that statement of human rights. So they have developed an alternative Islamic statement of human rights. And in the Islamic statement, there is a special emphasis on the rights of the community, uh, which supersede the rights of the person. And again, it is this feeling that if people have the freedom to leave the community, it could sabotage the integrity of the community. So yes, human rights are respected in the Islamic statement, but the emphasis is on the rights of the community, where in the Western world, the emphasis tends to be on the rights of the individual. And part of that, of course, is the free church movement, like uh, Baptists and Pentecostals, our strong emphasis that people are free to choose their faith. That's why we have adult baptism. And that has been a gift, I think, we've offered 
to the Western world and to the global world, in fact, that conviction that the person is free to choose. Let's read on. The church is united through the Holy Spirit and the confession that Jesus, the Messiah, is Lord and Savior. The Ummah is united through is Islam law and the Arabic Quran. Okay. Muslims make a big point about this. We all worship in Arabic in the same way, all facing Mecca, you see. Whereas the church is united through the work of the Holy Spirit and the presence of Christ within the believing community as we meet in his name. The church has no geographical, cultural, linguistic, or common worship center. It is a, com it is a community of remarkable di diversity. The Ummah has a geographical, cultural, linguistic, and common worship center. It is a community of remarkable uh, similarities in spite of the wide diversity of people in the Muslim movement. Um, our Muslim friends often say to me, the Muslim movement is united. We all pray in exactly the same way, facing Mecca, all that. You Christians are so extremely diverse. I say, that's exactly right, and we love our diversity. <laughs> and so in conclusion, the Constantinization of the church and the Islamic commitment to the unity of the Ummah and state have very much in common. However, the early church in Jerusalem and the early Ummah in Medina do not have a lot in common. The early church had no political or military power. The early Ummah was established through political and military power. And I don't mean that power was necessarily wielded unjustly. I think Muhammad used that power very wisely um, in, the way he, uh, in the way he put it together. These different visions reveal a very different understanding of the nature of the kingdom of God and his people and how God's will is done on earth as, done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, and when I say how, how Muhammad used political power wisely, one of the things he did there in Medina was to also provide space for small communities within the Muslim Ummah that are not Muslim. And he referred to them as Dimi. That means protected communities, you see. And so the Christians were permitted to continue worshiping and living within the Muslim community, but with some restrictions. And of course, they had to respect Muslim authority who had that privilege of living in that way. And so even today when you travel in the Middle East, you will come go, go through Jordan, and then you come to a village, and it's a Christian village. It's a dimi, you see. Then you go to other villages, and they're Muslim. But you come to a village, and it's, it's a Christian village. These dimi communities, Egypt, the same thing. And of course, in the urban areas, they tend to intermingle much, much more. I was just in Pakistan. And I was amazed at the freedoms of the churches in Pakistan as dimi within areas that are Christian, you see. And so right there at the beginning of the Muslim movement, there was this affirmation for the churches to exist as dimi, protected communities within Muslim society. Of course, with some restrictions. For example, no Christian man could marry a Muslim woman. But Muslim men may marry Christian women. Just one example. And of course, no Muslim can join the Christian movement. Christians may join the Muslim movement, but not the other way around. So there was restriction. Um, but if the Christians respected Islamic authority, they often had remarkable space with which to work and move. The Christians paid a special tax for the privilege of being a Christian. <laughs> and for the privilege of being protected by the Muslims. It costs something to protect you. Did you ever know that? So you must pay a special tax for that privilege. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efca.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150.
or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.